1985, the band Tear for Fears, Tears for Fears, yes, Joel, you better get this down. I'm waiting for you to sing this song. Weezer did a good version. You can check it out. One of their hit songs was Everybody Wants to Rule the World. And the words go like this. Welcome to your life. I'm not going to sing it, by the way. I'll let Joel do that someday. <laughs> Welcome to your life. There's no turning back. Even while we sleep, we will find you acting on your best behavior. behavior. Turn your back on Mother Nature. Everybody wants to rule the world. It's my own design. It's my own remorse. Help me to decide. Help me make the most of freedom and of pleasure. Nothing ever seems to last forever. Everybody wants to rule the world. Now, this was one of the band's hit songs that they released in 1980, 1985. And really, it's a song that addresses the problem of the human heart, of human corruption. That we want freedom and we want pleasure. Everybody wants the good design and they want, they want freedom and fl- pleasure, but at the same time, they're acting on their best behavior while working against Mother Nature. We can see this all around us, how people want power and they want it, and when they get it, they use it for their own advantage. We can think of, we can think of all sorts of political examples. In my lifetime, one of the most heinous acts of Political corruption was seen definitely in the Philippines when the Marcos family came to power. Amelia Marcos, the the wife of Ferdinand Marcos, had one room just entirely dedicated to the shoes that she had accumulated while they were in power because she had this knack for wanting to go shopping and using the political jets, the, the, the jets that were meant for government business, to do her own pleasure. And so when their son was recently elected, an entire generation shook their heads in the Philippines wondering how could anyone forget how awful it was, the political injustice and corruption that existed under the Marcos family, that their son could be elected to office. We could come closer to home. We can think of politicians who have been removed from office, impeached, people who have acted corruptly, that they've had best intentions, yet their designs have worked against the very things that they have been intending to do. In Proverbs 16, 25, towards the end of our passage here this morning, this passage is repeated from chapter 14, verse 12. There is a way that seems right to a man. In other words, that people attain power, they get power, And yet, in the end, it leads to death. And that means that we ought to have, in one sense, uh, an understanding of power and yet a little bit of a, a caution as it relates to how people use power. Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. And we're familiar with these expressions. We've seen it. And we live it. And yet, power has been given to all sorts of people in society in different, different spheres and in different ways. Parents have been given authority over their children to raise them, to instruct them, to teach them. And it is a terrible thing when children are at the hands of a parent who abuses that authority and that power. Teachers have a similar type of authority and of power. It's not just politicians. There's employers There's people who are directors who have staff underneath of them. There are pastors like myself. There are board members. There are all sorts of spheres of life where you experience some sort of power. And it's important for us to understand how power ought to function. We live in a day and age that is, one, highly suspicious of power, and two, it's trying to turn everything upside down as it relates to power because we don't have a clue as a society as to how God intends power to work. 
Proverbs has been put together, as you recall, as I have been suggesting to you, it's a manual that is pointing to future monarchs and how to rule and reign well and and how to lead a people, and yet it's all written in light of King Solomon. We're told this in chapter 1, verse 1, chapter 10, verse 1, the Proverbs of King Solomon, the son of David, and yet we know that Solomon used power in a way that was spectacularly bad. That he failed gloriously. And this is the thing that human freedom seems to abuse power. And the more power we have, it seems that we forget that we never have ultimate authority. That human beings have been made and been given power. We've been given this responsibility to have dominion over the earth. This is what God gave to Adam, to have dominion. And yet this dominion is to be used as a secondary authority. It's a derived authority. And so we need to get some of the wisdom of God so that we would understand how power ought to function. In our passage this morning, I want to look from Proverbs 15.20 to to the end of chapter 16, really the start of chapter 17. And I want to take a look at two things that will help us to understand how we can use power rightly. Because when we understand how we can use power rightly, then we can serve the world in the way that God has intended. I've often used the example of electricity. Electricity used rightly, it can do wonderful things. But you stick a fork into an outlet, which you should never do, kids. Don't ever do it. Please don't. Parents tell your kids don't do that. And you will kill yourself. So we need to understand how to use power rightly. Because when we use power rightly, it serves. It makes life better. When we use it wrongly, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. So let's take a look at two things this morning. How do we use, how do we understand ourselves so that we will use power rightly? The first thing I want us to see from Proverbs 15, 20, all the way down to chapter 16, verse 9, is that we need to enjoy the sovereign Lord. These verses really, they're building, they're building, they're building. And originally, all of these things were like individual tweets. Solomon had been sitting at his computer, tweeting away, filling up Twitter with all sorts of his wisdom. And then someone came along and began to pluck them out and began to place them in some sort of organized structure to to recognizing that Solomon, while he had failed as king, that he had lots of wisdom that God had given him. So taking all of these little nuggets of truth that he had spoken, plugging them in, trying to give instruction and direction to future leaders. There's this direction that comes, and it begins in chapter 15, verse 20, because it acknowledges, we, we, we can see that there's a bit of a, a distinction here because we go back to the wise son in verse 15, verse, chapter 15, verse 20. A wise son makes glad a father, but a foolish man despises his mother. But we keep on going, and there is more sense of joy and folly folly is a joy to him who lacks sense but a man of understanding walks straight ahead verse 21 verse 22 without counsel plans fall fail but many advisors with many advisors they succeed to make an apt answer is a joy you see that word a joy to a man and a word in season how good it is the path of life leads upward for the prudent that he may turn away from Sheol beneath. And here is the sense of what all these Proverbs are pointing us to, that there is a joy that is to be given in life. We can see that in that last verse that I read, verse 24. That when you receive the instruction that you have received from God, it is intended to give you this delight. And the way that we get that delight, the way that we get that joy, is we hear this message of joy, and we're told in verse 33 of this chapter that the fear of the Lord is instruction in wisdom, and humility comes before honor. So we have to understand, how is it that we, how is it that we are humble people in light of when we receive power? There's all sorts of these things, though, that are going to talk about power, and it's trying to prepare us to be a people who enjoy life, to enjoy the goodness of God, to enjoy his good gifts by being a people who fear God, who walk in humility. Well, how do we have that humility? Verses 25 through 
33 really speak of how this humility comes about. It's that the Lord will tear down, verse 25, the house of the proud, but he maintains the widow's boundaries. He's a just God. And he is, he is working out so that his ways are good. Verse 30 to 32, the, eyes of, the light of the eyes rejoices the heart and good news refreshes the bones. The ear that listens to life-giving reproof will dwell among the wise. Whoever ignores instruction despises himself, but he who listens to reproof gains intelligence. And here is part of what is being communicated to us. You want to live a humble life? You want to live a joyful life? There's a message. There's a life-giving message that comes to you that is intended to impart life to you. We call this, as Christians, we call this the gospel These are gospel verses, actually, in Proverbs. People often say, is there any evidence of the gospel in Proverbs? Chapter 15, verses 30 through 33 are evidence because the fear of the Lord is to walk in repentance and faith. It's to walk in a way of humility. It's to hear this message, to receive this message, to walk in repentance and faith, knowing that there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. So what does this have to do with the sovereign God? Well, the the good news that is played out in verses 30 through 33 of chapter 15 really begin to get explained to us in chapter 16. And what we have here are these words. These words that speak to how God is sovereign. Look at chapter 16, verse 1. The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the Spirit. Commit your work to the Lord, and your plans will be established. The Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. Go down to verse uh, verse 9. The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. And here is the real sense of what keeps us humble whenever we receive power is that all power is derived because the one who truly has power is God. He directs steps. He plans the ways. You can, a man can make his plans, but the Lord will direct his steps. The God is sovereign over history. Even the wicked are prepared for a day of trouble. That's it within God's plans. So, so therefore, in light of all these things that we hear in Proverbs 16, verses 1 through 9, what we hear is that God is the God who's sovereignly directing history. Because God is the God who is sovereignly directing history, then we need to check ourselves because we are constantly trying to gain control. This is what humans do. We do it in our vehicles. We have climate control. I've often thought it's interesting. You can have the passenger has climate control and the driver has climate control. And so how, I don't know how that works. You're not controlling your climate because it's mixing together. But at least there's that sense of control, right? You feel like you're in control of the temperature. Or there's the sense of birth control. We can plan our families and we can determine when we will have children and how many children we will have, or so we think. We have all these types of methods of control. We want financial control so that we can retire at a certain point. And as much as we think that we have control, and we think that we've got life, some sort of difficulty or tragedy comes along and it utterly throws you so that you realize, I might be able to control the climate in my car sometimes. But when trouble comes, I realize how absolutely out of control I actually am. That I I don't actually have the kind of freedom that I think I do. I I feel like I have freedom because I can go to the store and I can choose that I'm going to buy this shirt and that I'm going to wear this shirt today. And I can choose not to buy another shirt. I can choose what type of food I'm going to eat today. But we know that our choices are bound by our nature because the minute that we step outside of our culture and we're put into a different culture, we recognize that we feel like fish out of water. That the things that we feel like we've got under control suddenly feel uncontrollable. That we don't have a sense that we're in control. And this is because 
there is this sense in which while we have been given this, this freedom as human beings, we, we still live under the sovereign rule of God who, who orders and designs all of history. And because he's ordered and designed history, that means that power is always derived. You are always second in command. And it also means that when you see evil, verse 5 tells us that there is a promise Everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured, he will not go unpunished. God will deal with evil. That evil does not have the right to just run rampant and do whatever it wants. Even the wicked, verse 4 says, are made for a purpose, the day of trouble. That, That there's limits that God has set. This ought to comfort us. It ought to comfort us because it means that even though evil seems to prevail, in the end, the life-giving message that we heard in chapter 15, verses 30 through 33, is the message that will ultimately prevail. Why is that? Because God's king. He's the sovereign ruler who functions and rules over all of history. Now, if this is a manual designed for leaders, and they're looking at leadership, the leadership of Solomon... It ought to maybe give a pause because then you might say, well, what do we do? Solomon failed and this is despairing and what about the kingdom and what about our nation as it seems to be shifting in its moral compass and things begin to deteriorate and we don't seem to have the influence that we used to have. Well, in one sense, knowing that God is sovereign means that there are ebbs and flows to history. Absolutely. And we can rest in that. That may, we may not like the moment of history that we are in, but that doesn't mean that God is out of control. But the second thing comes from verse 6, is that there is always a way back. By steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for. And by the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. So here's the good news. The good news is that, yes, there are ebbs and flows in history, But the way that history is changed in your life is by the one who made the promise that I will be your God and you can be my people and I will forgive your sins and I can wash them away. And this is the covenant-keeping promise. That's what it means when it says the steadfast love and faithfulness that iniquity is atoned for. A covenant-keeping God, a God who says, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do it. And so 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says that if we confess our sins, He is what? Faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Because the ways of God are the ways of justice, the ways of righteousness, that we can feel as though we are free, and yet it is better for us, verse 8 will say, better with a little to be righteous, than great revenues with injustice. That what we need to understand, it is far better to walk with less in life being right with God than to be wrong with God and to have much. That when you actually know that the wise way of life, the good life, the way of power is not by seizing and holding on so that you have more, but it is even by having less because then you walk rightly before God and you walk on the right side of history, which will be determined long after you and I are gone. And it will be shown long after you are gone. And so for all those people who are on the radio saying that People live on the wrong side of history. The haughtiness to think that you know the beginning from the end. The the need here is that we all receive a derived power. We all receive a, a power that is from God. And that means that even the king is subject to God. In Deuteronomy, the king was to write out the law, Deuteronomy 17 tells us, because he was to remember that he was one of his brothers, that he wasn't above his brothers, he wasn't above the law. That yes, he gave the law, but he was the one who had received the very law from God. And just as our parliamentarians, they may pass laws, but they are subject to the laws. They're not above the law. And the reason they're not above the law is because there is one who is greater than the law. It's the lawgiver. It's the one who's sovereign over history. 
You have to understand that the sovereign one of history is the one who gives the law. And that means that all people then live under the rule of God. But the way that you live under the rule of God is not merely by obeying the law, but by trusting in the one who can forgive you when you break the law, this atonement that is talked about in verse 6. And so, we can see here that all power is from God. Because God is the one who is sovereign over history. That ought to give us a comfort and a joy. And the second thing I want us to see this morning is that while we enjoy the sovereign God, we are intended to reflect our righteous ruler. This is what chapter 16, verses 10, all the way through to chapter 7, 17 are dealing with. We get these royal uh, proverbs beginning at verses 10 through 15. It speaks about the king and how he is to act. An oracle is on the lips of a king. His mouth does not sin in judgment. A balance and scales are the Lord's. You see that derived power there? All the weights in the bag are his work. It's an abomination to kings to do evil, for the throne is established by righteousness. Righteous lips are the delight of a king, and he loves him who speaks what is right. A king's wrath is a messenger of death, and a wise man will appease it. In the light of a king's face there is life, and his favor is like the clouds that bring the spring rain." Here we get all these words about how the king speaks and how people are to speak to the king. And what we are told is that they're to speak in ways of righteousness, of justice and equity. That goes back to chapter 1, verse 3 of Proverbs. And this sense of righteousness that's showing up here is that the king is to speak righteously because he is under the law. He's to speak the word of the law and he's to rule by the law, the the rule of law. We've, We've heard a lot about that in the news often, the rule of law. That he's to function under the rule of law because true leadership understands that it's never truly, finally in charge. True leadership understands that it's never truly and finally in charge. That we are always subject. We are always subject. We all have to submit. We are all accountable. The Old Testament story of Joseph plays this out well. Do you remember in Genesis, the story of Joseph? He's a young boy and he has great dreams and great visions. He sees the stars bowing down to him. He sees wheat sheaves bowing down to him. And he understands that his brothers and his father will one day bow to him. And what happens to Joseph? After that, he tells the dreams to his brothers. and They so love the fact that their little brother is going to be one who rules over them. So what do they do? They do what every big brother does. They beat him up. They throw him into a cistern. Now, they do more than what most brothers do, and they even sell him into slavery. They fake his death. And Joseph is sold into slavery to the Ishmaelites, and he goes off to Egypt. He's put in charge, but he's put into prison. He's forgotten. And one day, when he dreams again, even after his dreams are forgotten, he suddenly finds himself rising to power, moving up, 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 until he is second in charge because now he has been given a job. And what is his job? He's to use the power that he's received to ensure that when Egypt is going to go into a famine, that all the world would be fed. And Joseph functions as one who has power to serve. But he's never the final one in charge. He's always submitted under the authority of Pharaoh. And in a sense, this is what power always looks like, is that we are always submitted, we are always second whether we're parents, employers, teachers, lawyers, doctors, whatever our occupation, whatever our position, whatever our vocation, we always receive our power as a derived power from one who has more power. And that humbles us, and it means that we ought to reflect the nature of the one who gave us that power. And the one who gave us that power 
We're told in verses 16 through 19, they're actually bracketed verses. Why? Uh, Verse 16, it says, How much better to get wisdom than gold, to get understanding, is to be chosen than silver. Verse 19, It's better to be of a lowly spirit with the poor than to divide the spoil with the proud. In other words, what's better than riches is wisdom. It's, It's better to have humility. It's better to understand your place in the world as one who submits under God than to have much and to think that you're something when you're actually nothing. And this is what here this passage is pointing us to. It's pointing out how desperately we need to reflect the righteousness of our ruler. That our ruler, our God, is one who rules with justice and righteousness. Verse 11 It says, a just balance and scales are the Lord's. And this is to contrast the verse 8, better is a little with righteousness than great revenues with injustice. It's better to walk rightly and have less than to act falsely and to have more. It's better to be falsely accused and to have a good name than to lie. It goes on in verses 20 through 30 to actually spell out what the righteous life looks like, to how we reflect our righteous ruler. Verses 20 through 24 speak about how we use our lips. Our lips are intended to be life-giving words. They're, we're to speak in words that it's a fountain of life, verse 22 says. Verse 21, it's sweetness of speech. Verse 23, it's persuasiveness to the lips. Verse 24, it's gracious words like a honeycomb. But contrast that with the words of destruction in verses 26 through 30. They function like fire. Their their mouth urges them on, verse 26. They plot evil. His speech is like a scorching fire, verse 27. It spreads strife, verse 28. Enticing his neighbor leads him in a way that's not good, verse 29. He's, He's got lips that bring evil to pass, verse 30. You see, what we're intended to do is to have lips that reflect the righteous judgment of the king. If the king was to speak, he was to speak righteously because his words were passing judgment. And you and I have been given the blessing and the privilege of words that we would be life-giving words, life-giving fountain words to reflect our righteous ruler. That we have been given this privilege. But it means that In the middle of these verses is verse 25. I've already quoted it several times. I think it's critical in Proverbs. There's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. That means that you can even have the right motivations in having power and still use power wrongly. And that ought to put a big pause on each one of us whenever we receive power. Why is that? You can have good intentions and you can still cause great destruction. You can have great power and want to use it well and still hurt people badly and it can lead to death. Unless you understand that power has to be grounded in the fear of the Lord, in repentance and faith, knowing that you have to know more about God and His ways. The more that you know God and how He uses power, the better you are in using power in your life. Because the way that God uses His power is on display for each one of us to see. Because when we look at every human institution, churches, church is not accepted. We can think of pastors who have abuse power. We can think of politicians who have abused power. We can think of people in public service who have abused power. We can think of all sorts of examples of people who had power and they abused it. And we can look at Solomon and think of how he abused power. And if that's the case, is there any hope for any of us to ever use power rightly? All of this is intended to point us to see the wisdom of Christ. Proverbs is driving us 
It's pushing us to see. We have a New Testament perspective that allows us to look back. And it gives us this perspective so that we could see something that maybe the Old Testament saints only could see glimpses of. Paul will say this in Colossians 2 verse 3, that in Christ is hidden the wisdom of God. That means that when we're in Proverbs, that the the wisdom of Christ is hidden there for us. It's intended for us to mine out. It's intended for us to work it out. How did Christ use his power? Here he comes with all power and authority from heaven. He can heal the sick. He can raise the dead. He can call a legion of army, a, 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 a legion of angels, armies together to, to rescue him. And when Satan comes to him in Matthew 4 and says, you haven't eaten in 40 days. Turn these stones into bread. You can just speak the word. What does Jesus do with his power? Bam! He could turn those rocks to bread and eat it. No. He says, quoting Deuteronomy 8, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the, the devil takes him and, and shows him, says to him, to, takes him to the temple and says, throw yourself off. Cry out to your father. He'll rescue you. He'll send angels. Use your power in that way. To which Jesus says, no, do not put God to the test. And Satan takes him and puts him on this high pinnacle and says, look, all the world could be yours if you just bow to me. And what does Jesus do? Get away from me, Satan. Worship no other God but God alone. In that moment when Jesus could have used his power for his advantage, he didn't. Because Jesus says in Mark 10, 45, the Son of Man came to serve not to be served. He came to give his life as a ransom for many. The way that he uses his power is by sacrifice. The way that he uses power is by laying down his life. This is why Paul will say in Philippians chapter 2 that you should have this same attitude as which is in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the very form of God, he didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing. Nothing. He took on the form of a servant. And he humbled himself, becoming obedient even to the point of death death on a cross. This passage will say that God opposes the proud, that, that he will uproot the proud, that the proud, there is a day of destruction for the proud, but for the humble, they will be exalted. And this is precisely what God does with Jesus. Therefore, God has highly exalted him, Philippians 2.8 says, and given him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so when Jesus comes to his disciples, he has all power and authority. And he says this in Matthew 28. All authority from heaven has been given to me. So how does he use his power? I'm going to flex my muscles and I'm going to show you how awesome I am as God. Therefore, go. Go in my power and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything that I have shown you. And listen, I'm with you always to the end of the age. How does he use his power? In that last moment before he leaves earth, he gives that power to you and me. And he gives that power to you and me by laying down his life, by forgiving our sins, by being the one who atones for us, by fulfilling all righteousness, by submitting under God's law and giving us this power and says, I have forgiven you, now you can do the same as me. And that's how power is rightly used. The power is used when we submit ourselves to the God who is sovereign over history The God who rules and reigns over all things. The God who has everything under his control. And he says, all power I give thou to you, but you go. And you use the power that I give you in my way for the good of the world. The world might hate you. The world might tell you that you're on the wrong side of history. The world will tell you 
that you are wrong and that you hate and that you do not know what love is. But when you submit to my ways, when you submit to my power, when you submit, what you will find is then all these temptations to power have been submitted under the lordship of Jesus Christ because it's not your power at all. It's his. And you want to reflect him and be his ambassador wherever you go. And that changes everything doesn't it? Now, we won't do it perfectly because we are not God, but we have one who has forgiven us, died for us, atoned for us, Proverbs 16, verse 6, who keeps covenant promises. And in light of that, then when we feel anxious or we feel worried or we feel like we just don't have things under control, we can remember that there is a God who does. Martin Luther, Martin Luther in the 1500s, in the heyday of fighting the abuses of the power of the Catholic Church, was faced with a situation over and over again in his life where he had to go into hiding. When he went into hiding, his wife Katie was deeply worried about him. We don't have the letter that Katie wrote to Martin expressing her worry about him, how troubled she was, but we have Martin's letter back to Katie. And this is what Martin said to his wife, Katie, about her worry. He said to her, Katie, I have a better worrier than you and all the angels. He lies in a manger and clings to a virgin's breast, yet is seated at the right hand of the Father, of God the Father Almighty. And if that is a man who faced death, who stared death in the face because he stood up to power that was being abused, then can't we submit ourselves to the sovereign God who rules over all history, who has shown us that the way is by a cross, that a cross precedes a crown, that to be low is to be exalted, that to be humble is to be great, this is the way, and we should walk in it. Let's pray. Father, you are a good and gracious king. We sang that this morning. And yet, what we need to remember, Lord, is that you're the sovereign God of history. You are the king of kings. You're the Lord of lords. So even now, as we come, we remember that because you've given us your power, not, not to abuse it, but to use it to serve the world, to serve and to protect, to do good, to love others. Lord, we confess that even in our best attempts, we are still needing to grow in your wisdom. We need to grow in how we use power. We need to grow in understanding how to speak well so that others are built up. Where we have failed, Lord, we turn to you and confess and pray, have mercy upon us and help us to use our words in such a way that will be for the good of the world and ultimately for your glory. For you are the King who is above all kings, and to you we come, and to you we sing. That's why we sing to you now in Christ's name. Amen.